Okay, Jay, if you're ready, I'll do the intro. Let's go for it. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and for joining us today for geothermal energy. Today's webinar is part of our Everyday Environment ser webinar series, and it's offered on the second Thursday of each month. My name is Dwayne Friend, and I'll be moderating today for Jay Solomon. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be shared to University of Illinois Extension's YouTube page. Please allow a couple of weeks for processing and closed captioning. We'll follow up with an email to everyone that registered when the video posts. If you have a question at any time, please feel free to type it into the chat box. I'll be moderating the chat and keeping track of questions to ask Jay at the end of this webinar. We also wanna mention that this webinar is a certified green event through the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment at the University of Illinois. We recognize the importance of sustainability and this webinar format has made it possible for us to offer these programs at a lower carbon footprint than our traditional programs. We encourage you to think about ways that you can be sustainable in your everyday life. Again, thank you for joining us for Geothermal Energy with Jay Solomon. And Jay, I'm gonna turn it on over to you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dwayne, for doing the introductory comments there and getting us getting us off to a start. Uh, glad to have uh, the group here and uh, looking forward to, to talking a little bit about geothermal energy and, and uh, in particular why the, the heating, cooling, and renewable option that it is. So um, as Dwayne said, uh, Jay Solomon, and I'll leave my camera on here for a couple of minutes here. And then once we get into it, I'll probably turn it off to save one bandwidth. I'm a natural resource environment and energy educator uh, based up in the Northwest corner uh, of the state in Joe Davies, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties, but I also work across the state with the rest of the team. Um, one of the other pieces of this is I come at this with a, a background in agriculture engineering. So, you know, the machinery stuff kind of fascinates me. And so I enjoy this part of it. So with that behind us, let's dig into this. So what I intend to try to cover today is a little bit of what it, how is geothermal energy, how is it renewable? You know, a little bit about what it is and what does it look like in, in Illinois? Um, and part of that, I'm gonna tie in a lot of the research and development that's going on on campus uh, along with uh, hopefully it's paying some tribute to the, uh, the folks out in the field who are actually doing some pretty good innovations as well. So as we move along, I'll, I'll try to share some of that as well. So how is geothermal energy renewable? Well, it's actually solar energy in a way, because we think about it, the earth is a, just a vast solar collector sitting out there on the ground sitting out there absorbing the heat in uh, and then radiating it back out. Uh, that's why at night where we've got cloud cover during the winter, it's uh, much nicer at night because it preserves the insulation and, and that, that heat coming back out just kind of bounces around out in the air and stays, stays there and helps keeps us warm. So as it absorbs the heat, it creates that layer on the top that's fairly constant temperature we'll talk a little bit about, but it also helps keep the core of the earth nice and hot, which is a, which is a good thing for us. Um, but geothermal systems, what they really do is they're putting some of that, they're, they're pulling some of that heat out of the ground and they're putting some of that heat back in the ground. So they pull some of it out or during the, during the winter, we're pulling some of that out. During the summer, we're putting some of it back in there and, and basically building up a little bit of reserve for, for the winter, which is how the, how the whole system works. So kind of the nice graphic here that gives you an idea of about how much, you know, 46% of what hits, hits the ground actually gets absorbed. And it's part of what causes, uh, we think about it, the heat island effect of a lot of our, our urban areas is that heat being absorbed and radiating back out. So if we think a little bit about what, you know, what solar energy is or what, so what geothermal energy is, sorry. Um, 
it's something we always have, sir. Some of us may have some other pre some preconceived ideas about. Because for a long time, whenever people talked about geothermal energy, it was all about geothermal power and, and power generation, uh, electric generation. Uh, and a lot of that happens out uh, in, in the West. And I'll talk about the areas where that occurs at uh, later on. But that requires a pretty high temperature source coming up and out of the ground. Um, so, you know, we're generating electricity. Most of the time that is steam, uh, steam driven uh, heat that's been, or steam driven energy that's being produced, uh, or turn, turning steam turbines to get the electricity out of it. So those sources are usually either deep down in the earth or are in those volcanic zones. Um, you know, think the Yellowstone area for example, where a lot of, there's a lot of discussion and, and some geothermal uh, power generation has been developed. There's the direct use uh, geothermal, which is kind of in the middle of that. It's where they look at using it for heating and cooling directly out of the ground, pulling water out and, and cycling it through. Um, and through the cycling it through a building and pulling that heat out of it uh, or cooling a building. And this is in the mid-range temperatures, what we think about as moderate temperatures, that 100 to 300 degree range. And if you look at the graphic on the, on the far side, you see some of the different purposes that can be used there um, of the geothermal and where that kind of fits in at uh, in these different zones. And then we get down to the geothermal heat pumps, or what we may often were called ground source heat pumps. And these are basically used for part of the whole heating and cooling of buildings is what we're really looking at. And these we can get from either surface application or shallow wells. And I'll talk a little bit more about the shallow well piece of it as we go through this. When we talk about depth of wells, think about uh, in the direct use in the deep wells items, basically we're talking about oil well type depth. We're talking hundreds of feet, uh, maybe even a, a thousand feet down or more. Whereas our ground source heat pumps, we're talking two or 300 feet, 400 maybe, that kind of a range. So there's the difference in what we're talking about. So that kind of sets the stage for it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, did I just miss a slide? No, I didn't. Um, so if we talk about, you know, what our opportunity is and looking at what our opportunity maybe here in Illinois is and, and from a geothermal heat pump or heat system set up, um, and especially that solar absorption, you know, here's a graphic of kind of the average temperatures at somewhere below 20 feet. Um, 20 to several hundred feet down, what that kind of average temperature range is. And if we look, Illinois is somewhere between, Illinois varies between about 50 degrees in the north end where I'm at to about 60 degrees down in the, the Carbondale uh, and, and further down area, areas of the state. So we've got kind of a nice range in there we can work with. It is a little bit latitude dependent and also altitude dependent, but um, gives us a good breakdown of where, what our opportunities are. You know, and this is a zone that's, that's a pretty consistent temperature, more a very consistent temperature in those areas. It won't vary very much from, from uh, our winter lows to summer highs. So one of the things about geothermal and the geothermal, you know, especially looking at it for heating and cooling, is this new technology? Eh, no, most of us, have heard about it most of our lives probably. Maybe different bouncing around some different names and things like that, but not new. A um, little bit of the history pieces of it, some of the first direct uses of it for heating buildings and, and uh, process uses started in about 1807 in the United States. Um, and if we look back, there's a lot of applications of it uh, in Roman 
Roman baths, some of that stuff that goes back to antiquity. But first really documented use, say 1807. The first ground source heat pump was installed in a, in a building in a home in, as a research project in 1948. And then in 1974, there was a US act that actually put funds into doing research development and demonstration. And that's where things started to, to take off. So we started our R&D research and development in the 70s during the energy crisis, and it still continues to go on. And we, we hope that we're building on some of that. So a little bit about a perspective on this. Why are we talking about it now? Primarily energy cost savings. US EPA looked at it, um, Environmental Protection Agency, estimated that geothermal pumps would reduce energy consumption as much as 44% over air source heat pumps and 72% over conventional electric heating and AC, air conditioning. So if we look at, you know, we're talking about potential of somewhere around 72, uh, and there's breakdowns for if you're comparing that to oil, uh, oil-fired uh, or um, natural gas, those kinds of, of applications. And as we all know, one of the pieces of that is you've got the cost piece of it, uh, which is all those are all open market and subject to the market changes. Some of the rationale behind why this is important, why if we think about geothermal being part of the reno renewable portfolio is heating and cooling accounts for about 47% of the energy used in commercial buildings uh, and roughly that same area of number uh, on homes and ground source heat pumps are moted to be the most efficient choice for most of these buildings. So it gives us that op opportunity to look at how might we be able to look at this and save, you know, probably in most cases somewhere around 70% of our electric bill or our energy bill with the new with, with the technology. So how is it a little bit about how does it work? What are we really talking about? So basically for one unit of electricity coming in, you've got about three units of free energy coming in for the earth that gives you about a four unit, four units of energy being put into a home for heating or cooling. Um, it's kind of nice because unlike some of the other power things we look at, it's consistent and we can actually maintain temperature around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week and not impact our cost significantly. Uh, and in fact, in most cases, you're better off to maintain a fairly consistent temperature across the full range of time uh, rather than going up and down, just the nature of the way it works. Um, it does offset a quite a bit of carbon and, and uh, other greenhouse gases. And the other piece of this is the overall just project footprint. In other words, the amount of space it takes up. If we look at what solar versus some of these other, the little red one right in the middle footprint, right in the bottom of that is geothermal. Because basically, you've got just a wellhead coming up there and you've got a few things you can't do over, over the top of it. So the amount of ground that it actually takes up is pretty limited. So if we look at what geothermal energy looks like in Illinois, what is it? As I've already kind of alluded to, kind of our limitations are, we're really looking at low temperature sources, a, a low temperature source, not so not power generation, but more heating and cooling. Still a big impact, but just you know, a limitation we have to recognize. So if we look at some of the opportunities and the graphic to the right kind of gives you an idea of some of the things we can do is looking at, at a geothermal heat pump. If we integrate it into the system, there's a lot of ways that it can do heating and cooling in the same pass uh, and transfer energy as we need it to all these different applications, whether it be heating a home or cooling a home, the ice machine that's there, um, going into hot being, after we collect some of that heat from, from doing the cooling, actually create some of the hot water we turn around and use back in a, in a shower 
uh, and into what clothes washing, that kind of stuff, uh, back in the swim pool, turns back around, back cool, and, and starts to loop over again. So it's that loop piece of it. The other thing is we can take that same loop concept and think about it in a district heating systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute, but it's the same idea of using it multiple times, not just using it once. So a little bit about what our potential in this area is. In the, in the US Department of Energy's geo, geo vision a few years ago, they looked at one of the, the graphics really give you an idea, graphically give you an idea of what we, our potential is. If you look, by color code gives you an idea of how much potential there is in, in capacity within the state. And because of our general temperatures, the types of buildings that we have and the uses we have and uh, the soil conditions we have and, and general weather conditions we have in the area, we've got what do they say 1800 and or 18,795 tons of capacity in the state. So a lot of opportunity there for development. It's not one of those, it's limited and, and there's only a, yes, there's a finite amount, but there's, there's a, considerably more than what we need. So we look a little bit at what geothermal looks like, geothermal heat pumps, and what those systems look like. Some of the older systems that a lot of us were from maybe familiar with were the old open loop systems where they were pulling water out of maybe a pond, running it through the house, running it through the, the heat exchanger and dumping it back into the pond. Or maybe it was pulling it from a well, running it through the house and then dumping it into the pond or, or basically dumping it on the ground, let it be used in some manner from there. Um, a lot of the newer ones, we're looking at what's called closed loop. Um, and these can be your traditional horizontal loop, such as the one in the top right-hand corner there, where you've got a loop buried in the ground, several feet down, uh, creating a loop to collect that, that energy the, the, to either cool or heat the fluid you're transferring in there. And this may not be water, it may be uh, a, a different solution that actually transfers the heat better uh, back and forth. So you run that solution through, run it through the heat exchanger in the home and put it back in the building. You know, if you think about it, there's two kind of pieces of this, you got your heat source from the ground and the, and the material that's pulling that, then you've also got the heat exchanger going into the house that's actually changing the temperature either in the hair in the air or is uh, it may be connected to a radiant heat system on the floor but anyway there's that transfer of heat into the building um, but one of some of the newer technology that we're looking at is is some of the vertical we're basically drilling it down like a well and putting loops in in these vertical pieces and it's taking more advantage of that deeper temperature that we've got the deeper temperature profile, less variation in the temperature profile. Now, one of the things with some of the changes in regulation and just recognizing water being an issue, there's not many of the closed loop systems out there. And if we're talking about new development, in most cases, we're not talking about um, using an open loop system. We're, we're much more thinking about a closed loop system. So kind of with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about some of the applications that are out there. And I'm going to tie the applications and, and move into the U of I research and teaching stuff because there's some real connections in there. And I think that talking about some of the research projects maybe does a better job of explaining some of the applications than just going through and doing some, some discussion about applications. But if we're talking about heating and cooling, obviously a lot of talk about doing homes, businesses are a real opportunity, large commercial buildings. Um, one of my introductions to uh, some of the newer geothermal developments uh, and the first vertical installations was actually a library, was a, was a public library. Um, so public buildings. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this district application where we're talking about multiples of either homes, homes and businesses, homes, commercial buildings, businesses, 
any combination of these things where you've got multiple sites pulling off and maybe they do need different different grades or different levels of heating and cooling uh, and, and maybe it's heating in one and cooling in another one as you go through that that work together from an ag side because that's kind of my background of, of looking at agriculture applications you know we'll point out one of the i won't say original but one of probably the most prominent examples of geothermal has been used for many years is the dairy plate coolers where they're basically um pulling water out of the ground running through the cooler and it's running running through a a heat exchanger and running cross flow to the milk that's being coming out in the milking process before it's put in the tank so they take the initial heat off of of it they turn around and use that water for cleaning drinking water other applications pull the heat out use it back into the dairy itself so it's kind of a, a, a unique thing that probably one of the places where we have quote unquote open loop still being used and most of us probably have run across that and didn't really think about it being geothermal greenhouse structures are another real opportunity basically keeping that heating and cooled uh, livestock buildings one of my introductions to a little bit of this was the old air uh, ground source heat pumps were ground source sources putting uh, cool pulling cool air in in front of livestock in a, in a building uh, particularly a, a, a farrowing building obviously shops just like commercial buildings where we cool them keep them a little more comfortable or keep them warmer when we work on things at night during the winter um, and there's been some discussion about crop drying and there's been some examples of crop drying now to say yes we've got some of that going on in illinois right now we i don't know that we do maybe some out there but at least we have that that's a topic we should think about applications and that's maybe what i'm more trying to put out there is here's some of the places where we could use it so thing laying out some of those opportunities out there and, and applications out there. Let's talk a little bit about some of the research and how we're taking some of the ideas or that campus researchers are taking some of the ideas and doing research and creating teaching opportunities on campus. And one of the places is looking at improving our knowledge and utilization of soil thermal characteristics and doing design. And in this, the, the pictures included here, um, where they're pulling core samples and rather than just looking and doing general characterizations of them, they're actually pulling those samples and doing a more of a thorough, more of a thermal uh, evaluation and to get those specific thermal characteristics of that soil type, that soil and that layer with whatever, um, saturation level that may have under normal circumstances and looking at the and because water plays into the heat transfer of and heat retention of some of these soils so that's one of the places where researchers are working on improving things and moving it to the next step there's already been installed on campus some geothermal heat pumps there's a some research work being done on district geothermal systems uh, something called energy foundations, which I'll, which I found very interesting. We'll share a little bit more about in a minute, and then some of the emerging stuff on direct use, direct use heating and cooling of uh, some deeper sources that we might not have thought about here. Um, and I kind of I want to say discounted, but because I knew they were coming, but it's not something we initially put in that. Oh, this is an opportunity in Illinois. But there's research out there that says, hey, this may be an opportunity for us. So with that in mind, the geothermal heat pump example that we had um, was the campus instructional facility. And a little bit about what they did with this facility is in looking at the and evaluating it, they found that they could reduce the energy use on the heating and cooling side by about 58% in that building by including geothermal heat pump in the system. Um, 
estimated annual savings on that was about was forty five thousand dollars with a projected 30 year cost of one point three five million. So not pocket change. Uh, definitely worth considering in there. Um, the graphic down below gives you kind of a breakout of what they were looking at in the way of energy, what that what that building currently uses in the energy. So yes, they still have um, some other energy components going into that. Some of that's backup. Some of that's just you need it to maintain that that type of a building and other other things going on inside of it. So one of the things that was significant about this was you saw the previous picture where they were pulling the samples, the, the core samples, looking at that through doing bore analysis, samples of some test holes that were done in the area where they were going to put the, the uh, geothermal field in, the bore field in. They were able to move it from the rule of thumb design criteria to uh, more specific criteria on it, more knowledge based criteria of, of that particular site and went from what was originally proposed as 60 wells to just 40 wells to meet the same, same goals, uh, which made that project much more appealing, shortened the payback period, as you see, from, from 40 years back to 28 years. Um, so that's one of the things we see that's really changing in this is as we know more about it, we can size these more correctly to meet the, the needs. So a little bit about how some of the things that have changed and what they're doing with that. Some examples of a couple of different sites that were installed here. Uh, the upper one is one related to a, a, a greenhouse at the energy farm where they they're stringing out, they're actually putting these in the ground, you get an idea of the length and depth. Unique piece of it, if you notice the right hand picture, you notice that there, you've got two tubes going into that tube being basically put down in the ground. They're actually doing the loop, the full loop inside of one well, one, one borehole. Each, each borehole has a full loop in it. So put the pipe down in it, put the, uh, the, the geothermal fluid pipe in it. And then they backfill that around to create that thermal mass to, to lock in the thermal mass around it, ensure, ensure good thermal uh, connection to the, the well uh, and the surrounding soil to, to take advantage of it. Uh, and therefore, we're getting all the heat in and out of it. We don't have the double where you're going in one and coming back out the other one, those kinds of issues. The bottom picture is actually from the building we were just talking about where they came in and did that and were putting these wells in, in what is part of the lawn area there on campus. So it gives you an idea. Once they get it put in, it's capped under, off underground, grass put back over it. The only people that know it's there are the ones who designed it and uh, or were there and were aware of it. So what's this district geothermal systems? Because it's one of the kind of the fascinating opportunities that we see out there. It's just basically the same concept as uh, the district chiller or district steam systems, very much like is used on a lot of traditional college campuses where you've got one power plant steam generation and they run the steam lines all through the different buildings to create heat in the different buildings. Well, instead of running steam lines, what we're talking about is running geothermal, a geothermal loop through these buildings. Basically can connect multiple buildings. Um, as you see the Corps of Engineers uh, graphic on the top there, they're thinking about as they look at some of their sites, what are all the things that we we have in there, we can connect in with it. And then how do we put that up? We've got one bore field that kind of sets it up and is, is the, the, the fluid driver pumps for the system and the location. And we may have some field, in other words, a borehole or, or multiples 
at these different buildings, but they're all part of one loop. So if one of them is not is a little behind, or if one of them is calling for more than than what its its field will produce right there on site, you can pull from the whole group. Uh, it makes it more efficient. So each one of them doesn't have to have a full set, uh, especially if you've got one that's generating heat and one that needs cooling. Uh, one that's generating heat and one that needs the heat, then you know they can work together. Um, the other side of that is maybe a common field where they're all interconnected. There's several different ways to look at this. Um, uh, let's say the dispersed field, a common field together. But the key thing is putting it together as a loop and using it almost as a utility instead of having to go install the whole thing. And there's opportunity in the, there's cost savings opportunity there in the initial investment because you spread that out across multiple buildings instead of each building having to have its own system. Another one that they have have put on campus, this is actually one that is a, has been installed um, is part of their both research and teaching facility is what's called an energy foundation or energy pile and it's basically a geothermal loop that's been installed as part of the foundation so as part of a, a, a design uh, whether it be a initial building or a renovation installed in the ground the nice thing is you've already bored a hole there to pour the concrete in to create the foundation. All we're doing is plumbing it up for geothermal with it. The geothermal mass of the foundation and the surrounding soil, soil provide your both your heat source and your heat sink uh, over time. Along. And so, you know, it's not taking up a big footprint uh, within it. And in this case, you see the steel cage being uh, put together for a, uh, a particular foundation piece, <coughs> pardon me, uh, in the graphic, you see the, uh, the, the black tubes in there where they're, they're uh, tied to the, the rebar. So inside of it, drop it down in, pour the concrete in around it, and you have a geothermal source there. So where was this done at? It was done as part of the Granger College, Granger College of Engineering uh, Hydro Systems Laboratory. It's part of a renovation. The loops were installed in four of the 12 50 foot deep concrete pilings. Um, not only did they install the loop in it, the, the loops in it, but they also put a lot of sensors and, and uh, data collection equipment into that. Uh, and so it now becomes a teaching piece um, for them into the classrooms as part of this building as well. So within that, it supplies approximately uh, 515 billion BTUs of energy per year for heating it, that's heating and cooling, and offset somewhere around 110 tons of equivalent uh, carbon dioxide annually as far as reducing your greenhouse gases. So important piece of it for that building. And they were able to put it into a very tight existing footprint. Uh, in other words, didn't have to come in and, and take out any green space, uh, those kinds of things where you already had a, a tight building as the graphic shows, not a lot of, lot of, lot of area to put it in and do the drilling into it, but you were already digging this hole, make use of it. So a little bit about what, a little bit more of the graphics of this, um, give you a little bit better idea of what they did. Um, as you see, the rebar in, in baskets that they dropped in. Um, and then the other piece of the, the black is, again, the, the geothermal fluid lines. The orange and the other colors you see there are all the sensors that they were putting in. In fact, this couple of my, couple of, uh, of the researchers that are actually connecting some of that stuff up and checking it before it was put in. So moving to some of the cutting edge stuff that's out there that are, that are being looked that's being looked at on campus. Um, 
and builds on the example we just saw um, is some what they're calling direct use uh, heating and cooling, but they're actually looking at a little higher temperature applications with this. Looking at the particular project is the Illinois Basin Geo, Geothermal Energy Feasibility Study for South Farms, which is part of campus there. And looking at doing some deeper loops to do some of the livestock, the greenhouse, uh, and some of the processing building functions there on the South Farms. So geothermal fluid basically is being extracted from the rock deep down uh, and put back in. It's kind of a two well system. So they're, they're cycling it pretty down at, at essentially gas well depths. So we're not talking shallow stuff. As you see, they're looking at uh, somewhere between uh, 1500 and around, around 6,000 feet down. Um, and the wells could produce 2 million, 2 million BTUs per hour um, of thermal energy. I'm not sure I've got that, I've read that correctly. Anyway, a significant amount of, of energy. Um, and what they're basically saying is the basin has the capability to produce uh, the equivalent of uh, 230 million barrels of oil in a given in a given year. That's 1.5 times the annual electricity and fossil use in the United States. So, you know, basically we've got enough energy right in this area if we could harness it theoretically to power everything. Now, key pieces theoret theoretically, but that's opportunity to offset that energy use. So looking at how do we tap into that and make use of it. So moving a little bit into extension collaboration and how can we provide more resources to the folks that are on this call? And you know, this is really where we, we get down to is having created these campus connections. Um, and how do we get some more of this information to you now that we've created the ideas of things you could use with it. So it's part of a project that got me started on this um, is, is a, a joint project with some researchers on campus, uh, one of, uh, at least one of which is on, on the call with us today. But what we're, work, what we're working on first is to build an interactive system to disseminate that technical data. When we talk about those, those geothermal properties of those wells, well, we happen to have within the geologic survey and other entities on campus, a pretty good stack of information, which I'll show you a little bit of that in a minute. And that makes it a lot easier for someone to do some development with. In other words, to have some of that idea of what could be happening or, or how to, what's your, what's your potential given your soil conditions. There is a, Building on that, we're looking at doing a development or developing a decision support tool. In other words, taking some of that data and making information out of it. Uh, and then the other part of that is taking tying uh, a dashboard that would be off the extension website to host this information. So you actually can access it anytime, 24 hours a day, year round, those kinds of things. We're also looking at continuing to do webinars like this one. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of that data. So this interactive system for disseminating the technical data, a couple of things we've got is on the right is a little bit of an idea of the type of the depth of, or the, the type of data that we've already got. Maybe I should say the number of data points that we would have to start from. These are information about some of the existing wells and that kind of stuff that um, could be, be used. Um, and so rather than being on campus and, and a lot of installers know about this and will call up and go, hey, can you give us some information about wells in this area? And so rather than them having to go dig that out and get it to you, um, This is a way to be able to pull it down. So 
they're looking at doing a uh, ESRI GIS interactive map that would allow you to zoom into an area and then create a 3D graphic of what's the soil conditions in that area and start building uh, that information out to do uh, estimates of what your, your soil capabilities are in that area so that you can better design a more effective geothermal piece. Um, so that's kind of the graphic on one side of that. Whoops. A little bit of what the, the dashboard would look like is this is kind of a, a mock-up of it. Um, we would say that a lot of the stuff here is real and real data. It's just not fully live yet is where this is at. So we'll be rolling this out uh, latter part of this year. Um, the big thing we've been working on is putting together the map and all the pulling all the data together that's that is graphically displayed uh, here on the right side, right hand side of the slide again. Uh, so that part where, well, that is actually a live, a, a actual screen capture of, of live data. So we're, we're at that point, we just need to put the rest of it together. So the decision tool is something that uh, another researcher and some grad, uh, grad students are working on and here's an example of, of what they've done with it um, in this kind of decision support tool. So we've got, you've got information about a group of wells. And in this case, what they've taken is um, where you see the lines going vertically in it are, are wells in that. And this is a cross section uh, across the U of I campus there in Champaign-Urbana. And what they've been able to do is run what is the thermal characteristics all the way down. And if we wanted to do a geothermal system down to a certain depth, what is that geothermal characteristics in that area? What would that look like? What kind of, of uh, energy production could we expect out of it? So this is the kind of data that they're putting together. Um, I know there's a lot of information on the slide. What we want to do is be able to do graphically present this, but ultimately as the, the piece in the bottom starts to get at is give you actual numbers of what that would do. So you actually can take those and start plugging those into your design criteria, very much like what they did with the one on campus. So that they can re reduce the number of or boreholes needed, the number of loops needed to generate the kind of energy they needed. So ultimately, what we hope to do is something like this, and, and like the uh, graphic you saw on the, on the first one, uh, uh, is create this 3D uh, geothermal model for the basin, for the area that gives you an idea of, okay, here's the kind of energy uh, outputs that you could expect in this area, and, and be able to specify a zone. So you not only is it specific to an area close to a well, but actually be able to extrapolate it between wells and out across the region, be part of a story map. And so this is one of the things we're looking forward to, to having out there is make it better for, for you as the end consumer, better for the, better for the installers, people who are, are specking them out, and better for you as the end consumer to both uh, be able to look and see is the installer really taking advantage of the best information out there? And is what they're proposing in the right range of what it should be? So with that, one of the things that I want to do here is acknowledge um, the one last piece that's really happening with this. And a lot of this research is all part of uh, the Illinois Geothermal Coalition, which is the researchers on campus connecting with uh, folks in industry, uh, nonprofits that have gotten an interest in geothermal, other researchers from across the country, across the nation and across the world, really, uh, and trying to work towards creating uh, 
Illinois as a geothermal information hub um, and established us as one of the one of the places to go to for information about geothermal. And I have to thank this group for a lot of the information and the graphics that I was able to share with you today. Um, as part of a collaboration grant, I became uh, involved with geothermal and was invited to be part of this this coalition uh, and sat in on monthly meetings of some of the the research that's going on and became aware, much more aware of the opportunities that are out there. So, you know, one of the pieces is out there, and I want to thank them uh, as a as a group for all they're doing, acknowledge the help that they've given me, including uh, the Illinois Geothermal the Geothermal Association of Illinois. So with that, thank you very much. And I think there might've been some questions that come through there, but I'm not sure I caught them. So with that, I'm doing a little longer than I anticipated, but I think we're okay. Okay, thank you, Jason there. And yeah, we do have a few comments and um, questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through the, uh, the comments here, uh, starting off. Uh, it says Los Alamos National Lab has an active geothermal project, or had an active geothermal, and guess still does, in the 1970s. The labs are in uh, the uh, Jemez Mountains, which were formed by volcanic activity. Yes. And then um, here's a, a question. What are the boundaries of the carbon footprint comparison between different energy types or mining, mater mining materials, manufacturing, transportation, et cetera, included besides physical footprint versus energy generation? Um, in answer to that particular question, the footprint we were looking at there was the actual physical footprint, not the carbon footprint. Now, having said that, the carbon footprint should be pretty good to really good. Um, it's not something that I know right off um, because of the things that you list out there of the, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, of the, the materials, all the materials that go into it, that kind of stuff. But um, that, that is an area that it deserves its own presentation in some ways. But in, I hope that that's clear that what we were looking at was the physical, was the actual physical footprint. And what we've got is, is solar is seeing a lot of attention right now. But one of the drawbacks to solar is it does have a fairly large physical footprint. That is, the panels take up space and they continue to take up space. Whereas we think about geothermal, you've got the pumping system and stuff like that that's in a room um and you've got a little bit of an area that maybe you, you're limited in what you can do across it but for the most part it's going to be a lawn or or grass or some kind of production out there that that you can continue to utilize there's nothing above the ground that's being used so that's the piece of that what we were trying to get at okay uh, Dr. Stump had included a link to an article about geothermal heat pumps in the U.S., so hopefully everybody saw that. Yeah. Thank um, you, Andy. Another question for home, or well, it's a comment, I guess. It says, for homes, not good fit if you have to retrofit. Um, they said they had, in their situation, they had to use a split system that never worked well together, also need supplemental heat in the winter. Um, and also not every heating and cooling company can work on them. I would, would concur on, you know, there's some very good points there. And one of the things that we hope that we're, that, that is changing in the industry with some of the research and some of the other things is to overcome some of the limitations that you experienced there. So I would totally agree with you there. Okay. Um, let me get back to where we were at. Uh, okay, this was on the um, where they had the uh, um, lines going through the foundation. Is the property above the horizontal bore field still? Well, I guess this is a general question. Is the property above the horizontal bore field still usable for other building projects? 
I think this this was more of a, just a general question. So property above a horizontal bowl field, can you still use that for other building projects? You, theoretically, you can. There are some limitations above it. Basically, you've got to recognize that there's you've, you've changed the soil characteristics there. And at some point, you might need to get into it. The other part of that is you don't want to do something that might damage your lines that are running from basically the bore field back to the building. So not saying you can't build above them, but you need to put some good thought into what you build above it. Yeah, and Jay, I can comment. A lot of new buildings, they actually put the geothermal system in when they're building the building. So they, they'll they drill the boreholes either beside the building or in the basement. And then you don't have a problem with that. That's all connected with the building. and and. Uh, and then for use of land, like for the campus and structural facility, they turn the land above the board field back to the kind of to the common area, the grass, the grass park area that it was before. And so there was no real uh, impingement on the previous use of the, the land. So, uh, Andy, while you're unmuted, you might help me with one of the, the other question. What type of slurry was used to used in the boreholes to backfill the long long tube runs? So they used a geothermal grout, which is made up of, uh, I guess, bentonite clay and uh, graphite to make it more conductive um, to be able to exchange the heat with the ground. Yeah. All right, thank you. I knew you told me, but I couldn't didn't remember what it was. So thank you. Sure. Okay, the next question, I'm curious about how repairs might be made in the tubing if it's embedded in cement. Well, the the number of cases where something's failed is 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 not very very few very few cases where they had to do um, repairs, and so I would probably the best or the easiest way would just be to close that borehole and drill another one, and then reconnect it in. But the amount of, amount of times that's happened is, is very few. Of all the all the geothermal systems have been installed in the U.S. So. Um, and there was a question about how deep the boreholes uh, and does the concrete affect the transmission. Um, those boreholes you were talking about, in, if you're talking about the ones in the uh, in the thermal pile, uh, those were about 50 feet deep. Was what it was listed as. Yeah, in that case, the other thing mentioning is that they were already going to put the foundations in for the bridge. So putting the geothermal system in was free basically because you had already drilled the hole. Yep. You just put the tubes in with the cement that's already going in. And um, you just, it's a lot more cost effective than drilling separate boreholes for that. So. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to make that. That was on my notes and I forgot to make that point. Okay. Uh, this next question, I'm guessing that it's dealing with the, uh, the, Foundation pipes again. Are these systems getting used for residential homes yet? Uh, and are there any estimated costs or government rebates? Molly, if you're still on and I'm getting your question wrong, can you uh, help clarify for us? No, that's it. I'm just curious. I mean, we have solar panels on the roof, and I was just wondering, you know, is, is this the next step or are we not quite there yet? Does it more have to evolve before we get to that point? The, the residential side of it is pretty well there. In fact, one of the things that I didn't talk about is there's, and, and answers your second question is, there was, there is, was, was, I guess it's still going on, a project in Urbana where the city of Urbana was doing a community buy. And so basically people could um, get geothermal installed by a particular installer on a contract uh, that was a kind of a set set rate that was extremely competitive you know was was the best bid for assuming they were doing doing several in the, in the community so yes it's being done and yes there are there are some there are cost estimates out there um, i didn't get into them because there are several different factors when you get into it to look at um, as far as government rebates, that's the one piece that we're trying to work on. It, that's 
that the industry is trying to work on to get get more included with some of the the incentives. Yeah. So there. Helpful. Go ahead. I was going to say there's a there's a federal tax credit of I think it's twenty six percent at the moment. Okay. Um, and if you're wanting to include geothermal with the solar, that's even that's even better. You can almost get your house to to net zero that way. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that, that's the all the, that's the goal. I I, I, jo I joke about it because geothermal and solar is is about the 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 best pairing because solar runs your pump, your electricity. You got you got to have with geothermal. You have to have some electricity. Solar can provide that electricity. Okay, we have time for one more question, and that's how many. Well, we have a couple of questions here, but we'll see what we can do in the next minute or two. Are there problems using the technology in subsidence zones or areas that have been heavily mined? I don't know for sure, but knowing the nature of those, it's definitely an area you'd want to be concerned about it. And knowing what, how deep those subsidence zones are. I know that's a little bit of uh, some of what that um, the newer research that the last topic I talked about, the, the direct use, that's a little bit of the area that they're looking at uh, in conjunction with some of that. It's, the older oil wells and maybe even some of the the uh, the coal mine areas, how that might tidy, you know, how they might utilize that and re repurpose those. So it's probably something that merits some looking into. Yeah, Not and the, the other benefit, if you actually have an open quarry or, or a mine, you can actually use that as your geothermal resource. Because that'll give you constant temperature year round. So you actually can use that as your exchange rather than a, than a well. But the subsidence zones, that could be, if, you know, if you're not, well, if you're above it, maybe okay. If you're going through it, could be a little bit of an issue. Sure don't want the, the system to try to compact itself. All right, we'll do this last question here. Would there be a source of reputable contractors available for Northwest Illinois to install a geothermal system in residential applications? And actually, is there a, a statewide map that maybe would be broken out regionally? I don't know that there is. Probably the best thing is through the... Um, the Geothermal Association. Sorry, you, John Freitag would, would know. Yeah. Um, also, if there's a cooperative up there, they also have their own geothermal program. All right, that takes us up through all the questions. So thank you very much, Jay. Again, great information. Uh, Dr. Stump, thank you for your uh, yeah. additional uh, information as well. Yes. And uh, hopefully you got the, the information that you wanted. Um, if you want more information, I'm sure you could contact Jay and he would be glad to, to help you. Uh, hope you all can join us next month for our next environmental uh, or everyday environment webinar, which is going to be the conundrum of common names. So it uh, should be an interesting one. And we'll thank you all for joining. And with that, we are going to sign off. Yeah, the one last thing I would ask is that uh, please take a few minutes to do the, the evaluation form, if you would. Yes. And those have been, uh, you can see that on the slide. And you, you've also had it in the chat. So again, thank you. And um, we will sign off. Thank you.